Hi everyone. My name is Sean Sova and I'm a member of the class of 2022. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight and welcome to our wellness during COVID-19 webinar. There is a Q&A function below to ask any questions that you may have and we'll be monitoring the questions to follow up afterwards if certain questions are not addressed or answered. On the screen, there is a QR code. Please take out your smartphone and scan this QR code to check into our webinar. If you have any questions about this, as it says on the screen, please let us know in the Q&A chat. Tonight, we'll be hearing from Liz Drexler-Hines, the Director of the Student Wellness Education, and Kelsey DeVoe, Director of Health Services. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Hill. So excited um, that everybody can be here tonight. And again, I'm Liz Drexler-Hines, Director of Student Wellness Education please follow on Instagram at HC Swellness, um, where you'll find a lot of information actually about what we're gonna be talking about um, tonight. So just really quickly about my office. Um, so student wellness education, I advise or co-advise a number of um, peer health education groups that, um, and there are many more, um, beyond these, but um, I just wanted to point them out because there are a lot of peer resources for you um, to find information and education about all kinds of different wellness topics. So the Students for Responsible Choices um, focus mostly on substance use. Um, no matter what your choice is, they have a lot of education and programming that they do throughout the year. Um, and their applications actually will be out next week. The relationship peer educators focus on um, sexual violence prevention, rape culture, promote consent and healthy relationships. Their applications are also out. So definitely check them out. HC Twist is a group of student athletes who do substance use work um, for along with the SRCs and for student athletes. And fairly new um, and we're very excited about them are the student health ambassadors. Um, so you'll, you'll see them around campus, you'll see them virtually, um, some are even remote students, but they're being trained in all things COVID, prevention, behaviors, all of that stuff. So they're really um, around to give you a mask if you need some extras or sanitizer. Um, and just kind of figure, helping you figure out like, oh, I need to really talk to my friend or my roommate about like some risky behaviors or some things I'm not comfortable with. Um, so they're gonna be a great resource for you as well. So we're in a pandemic, we're in orange on campus. It's, it's, it's okay. Uh, we are all in this together. So it is possible to have, and I wanted to point this out, it is possible um, to find wellness opportunities, even with all of this stuff going on. So you may have been introduced, if not now, you will be very soon to MyHC. Um, and so you can find my office, campus recreation, um, office of student involvement, to find lots of resources and lists for all things virtual um, and what's going on on campus around um, different wellness opportunities. Um, we will have a campus recreation loan in the bottom floor of Hogan, um, which is kind of grab and go equipment, which you'll be able to take back to your room and use if you need a workout um, or some outdoor activities. So more to come on that. Um, there'll be lots of programming opportunities, especially there'll be more once we can get to yellow. So Kelsey is going to talk a little bit about why we all have to work together to get ourselves to yellow so we can be doing some more of these things in small groups and in person because that's what I want to do as well. Um, really encouraging you to explore campus. 
um, especially for physical workouts. If you haven't hiked up the hill yet, you will. Um, and I remember that when I part first started working on campus, I, my breath, I took my breath away. <laughs> so it took some time to get used to going up and down that hill, but there's lots of different places for physical activity, all those stairwells. Um, you'll find your own path throughout campus. And there are even trails and paths around campus. So definitely check it out. Um, we'll also have mindfulness and meditation opportunities through my office, um, Instagram Live, Zoom, all of those things. Um, and check out the Wellness Weekend newsletters. They come out on Fridays. Um, so we'll have lots of those opportunities. Okay, but I did want to take a minute to talk about substance use because substance use you know, goes hand in hand a lot of times with college life, not all of the time, but it's definitely a question I get all of the time from incoming students, from parents around like, what, what is that like on college campus? So I just want to take a few minutes to kind of point, you know, a few things out to you, which, you know, we may be coming in with some perceptions about how we do college, how maybe alcohol, cannabis, and other substances might be involved in that. Um, and certainly it's no secret that they are a part of the social life of campus. But I want to also point out that there are, there's an entire spectrum of what people choose to do around those things. So for those of you who took alcohol EDU, if you remember way back when um, online, we got some data back from your class, from the class of 2024. And these are all, you know, these are all anonymous. And so this is what your class is saying. So when we asked all of those questions about your substance use, this is what we got. So at the time, this was back in October, 38% of students in your class actually said they, they abstained from alcohol, like they, cho they chose not to use for whatever reason. And then 28% identified as non-drinkers. So maybe they've used alcohol in the past, but they just um, didn't recently. Um, and then we have 10% who are moderate drinkers. And then we have some higher risk drinkers too. Um, but you know, you might be looking at that being like, no, no way, no way. There's no way that that's, that's the case. You know, the class of 2023 actually looked pretty familiar and pretty similar. And so did the class of 2022. So, you know, we see nationally, that there's about, there's at least more than a quarter of students who actually come in as abstainers from substance use. That shrinks a little bit over their time at college, but not too much. So there are people out there who are not using for whatever reason. And so then we can look at upper class students. So that's this, this um, chart on the right. And so we do these anonymous wellness surveys all of the time on campus. And so last fall, this is before the pandemic, we asked students, have you ever used cannabis or alcohol any time in your life? And so this is including freshmen to seniors. Um, and you can see almost 20% said no to alcohol and almost 60% said no to cannabis. So there is, for the past four years since I've been here at Holy Cross, we have raised between 20 and 23% of students who identify as non-users. So, you know, we have that picture of kind of college substance use, what that looks like in the movies, um, in our heads. But I think it's really important to remember that if this is your choice or if you're thinking about your choices, it's probably a little more moderate than you think it is for the use. Okay. So again, looking at those students, the Holy Cross students who do use, a lot of them actually use pretty moderately. This doesn't mean there isn't any risky behavior going on because there definitely is. Um, but they use pretty moderately. So those um, Holy Cross students who had less, four or less drinks the last time they partied, we had almost 59% of students who said that was the case. That's pretty moderate over the course of the night, okay? And if you're looking at blood alcohol content of the, that had um, those students who had a BAC of less than 0.08, which is the legal driving limit if you're over 21, 62% of 
So again, moderate. And actually, those mod that moderate use is up since the last time we did this in 2016. And that's going along with the national trend. So that's pretty good. That's pretty good news. Okay. You got this in Alcohol EDU, you got this in other places, but now the semester is starting, so just a refresher. When we're talking about blood alcohol content, all of those things, you have to make sure we're thinking about standard drinks when we're talking about that. So 12 ounces of beer equals eight to nine ounces of malt liquor. That's kind of like your twisted tea kind of stuff. Um, five equals five ounces of wine, one and a half ounces of liquor, and that's in a standard shot glass. All of those things equal one standard drink. So the general rule is if you can kind of stink to one standard drink an hour over the course of a night, you're going to have a good night without any of the negatives. Another thing to remember, how many standard drinks of liquor are actually in a bottle? Um, because one of the things I do um, for my job is I will see students who have to get transported to the hospital for alcohol um, overdose. And a lot of times the culprit is hard liquor. And especially the first years, the culprit is hard liquor and not measuring a standard drink. So it's really important to remember. So kind of your standard bottle of a fifth is 16 shots and a liter is 33. So that's really important when you're making your calculations. Um, so, you know, if you're going to choose to use free pouring, just kind of pouring liquor in a cup and then pouring in a little bit of juice or something like that is out. That just leads to a lot of problems because um, nine times out of 10 people pour way more than what they were kind of um, expecting to do. Um, and that leads to, leads to kind of negative behaviors. So you can use a solo cup as a measurement. That very first line in a solo cup is one standard um, drink of liquor, okay? Or you can take a shot glass and pour that in and then the rest chaser. And if you choose not to drink, lots of other great ways to use a solo cup. Shirley Temples are my favorite. Okay, so if you're going to choose to use knowing what your blood alcohol content is, you can kind of plan ahead. Again, this is going back to alcohol EDU. There's always an app for that. So I, if you're going to choose to use alcohol, I would highly encourage you put, put one of those apps in the BAC calculators in your phone. Um, and then you can kind of see, um, you know, what, what a good night out would be versus kind of going over the tipping point. And then I get this question all of the time from students that I see. Most students will say the things that they enjoy about using alcohol is kind of this fuzzy buzz, a good buzz, I'm not out of control is something I constantly hear from students, but the stress is off a little bit, I'm laughing a little bit more and that's great. What they don't like is being out of control, vomiting, slurring my speech, texting somebody I didn't really want to text, right? Um, so a lot of students will ask me, well, what's the tipping point? And so what's good is that the tipping point is actually the same for everybody. How many drinks it takes you to get there is a little bit different based on your BAC. But what this shows, it's called the biphasic effect. And what it shows is the tipping point. So here's your BAC. You're starting out the night status quo and you know you start drinking up to about a 0.055 BAC. And that's your good fuzzy buzz. That's a good, like, I'm feeling awesome. I'm still completely in control. Sometimes people will call this the green zone. Once you hit a 0.055, that's where the depressant effect of alcohol kicks in. Alcohol is a depressant, if you remember your high school biology class or health class. And that's when you start getting things like slurry speech or I fall down and those kind of things. So you can go back and pre-plan, where is my BAC to a 0.055 or less? How many drinks is it gonna take me to get there? Okay, so some final tips. 
Um, first one is you, if you're going to choose to use, you don't have to do that every weekend. And actually we saw in the numbers, um, most Holy Cross students actually don't, um, they'll take some weekends off and there's plenty of stuff. There's plenty of stuff to do on campus. And we've all found during the pandemic too, some really interesting virtual ways to connect as well. Um, which I'd love to hear from you if you have some new ones. And if you do choose to use, make sure you're eating a meal beforehand. That's really important. Hydrating before, during, and after is really important with water, with non-alcohol. Okay, alcohol actually dehydrates you. It's a diuretic. So um, getting keeping that hydration going is really important. Talked about measuring one standard drink an hour. And if you're choosing to use cannabis, knowing the THC content is really, really important, especially with edibles. And then the last thing is talk with your friends and your roommates about this stuff. What is what's acceptable in your room and what is not? We know what the campus policies are. So those are really important to bring into the conversation. Um, better to talk about it now than not. Okay. And finally, um, the Good Samaritan policy is something that we have on campus. So what we want, if anybody is, you know, had too much alcohol, uh, we've had some cannabis overdoses via edibles actually, or dab pens and high THC contents. The last thing we want to happen on campus is for somebody to have a medical emergency um, and not be treated for that. And so what we have on campus is a good Samaritan policy. So if you are witnessing somebody who has had too much, and we know that hopefully we know the signs of that, you can call campus police because that will trigger getting them an ambulance and the medical help that they need. So neither the student who's intoxicated or the person who calls is going to be subject to disciplinary action. Okay, we want the person to get the help they need. And we're going to thank you up and down that you made that call. Okay, so, you know, in rare circumstances, if there are other violations, like there's violence or physical harassment or something else, you know, that might add to it. But just the fact that somebody used substances or actually this applies to COVID too, or somebody's out of compliance with COVID, we, we don't care about that. We want the person to get the medical help they need. The person who um, gets the medical help will have to do an educational session with me, um, but that's really it. And there's a really good purpose for that educational session. So please make sure Campus Police's phone number is in your phone if it isn't already, and make the call. Okay, Kelsey, you are on. Thank you, Liz. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Kelsey. I'm the Director of Health Services. So I wanted to um, go through a few really quick slides, and then I'm hoping that you all have tons of questions. Um, so I'd love for you to start dropping those in the Q&A and I'll get to those at the end. Um, I could talk about all this stuff for, for an hour, but um, I'd rather hear what you are missing and, and make sure I answer those questions. Um, so as I'm chatting, feel free to put those in the Q&A. Um, so Health Services is located in Loyola, um, which is down on um, the lower campus um, it's one of the dorm buildings, but we also are, are in that building. We're there Monday through Friday, 9 to 12 and 1 to 5, and our phone number is there. I really suggest that you store that number in your phone. Um, if it's outside of, of business hours, we have a doctor who's on call, and I think you should store that number in your phone too. Um, or if you download the RAVE app um, that Public Safety has, all of those numbers are stored right in the RAVE app. Um, so that's something I suggest that you look into doing. Um, the physician on call can answer any of your medical questions if it's um, overnight or on the weekends. 
Um, we have a patient portal, which you all hopefully have uploaded all your immunizations to. Um, we still have a few people missing things, so I will be sending you an email in the next week or so to make sure we get all that. Um, in that portal, you can see all your lab results and messages from your provider, and that's also how you can schedule um, appointments with us in health services. Um, we do all sorts of things in health services. We do urgent care, so if you're sick or um, you know have an urgent issue, and then we do primary care, so if you have something that you're working on managing long term, um, we have a nutritionist who um, can meet with um, folks for any sort of variety of reasons. We do COVID testing, and then of course um, any COVID symptoms or questions, we'd love for you to come to us. Um, you know, as Liz said, we have um, certain policies on campus where we really don't want to get anyone in trouble. We just want to make sure that everyone is safe. Um, so if you have any COVID symptoms or had an exposure, we, we would want you to call us at health services first and let us know. Next slide, please. Thank you. So really quickly, I just want to show this graphic. Um, you know, this is a great um, example of how COVID spreads. Um, there's an asymptomatic spreading period for about 48 hours where you don't know that um, you're positive, you haven't had symptoms yet, or you haven't had a positive test, and you're transmitting COVID. And so if everybody was just running around campus doing everything with no masks and, and no social distancing, we would really have a, a huge outbreak. Um, it spreads exponentially. So by the time one person is positive, they've spread it to two people who have already spread it to two more people. And then you end up with a cluster on campus, um, which would end up meaning we all had to go back home, which is what we're trying to avoid this semester. And so if you look at the picture on the right, just by cutting down transmission in half, just to the one person, you stop that outbreak. So that's really what we're trying to do this semester with all of these policies is to just reduce transmission. We're not going to get rid of COVID on campus. That's impossible. But we can do a lot of things to, to reduce um, the spread on campus. You can go to the next slide for me. Thank you. So we have tons of policies on campus and hopefully you've all read the spring guide. And if you haven't, definitely go back and take a look through that again. Um, we have a universal mask policy. So everyone should be wearing masks on campus inside and outside, unless you're in your room with the door closed. Um, we have our testing policy. So students are expected to test twice weekly and staff is also testing twice weekly, um, staff that's on campus. Um, <clears throat> with that testing policy twice weekly, I encourage you all to remember that a negative test does not necessarily mean um, a free pass. So just because you're negative doesn't mean that you should go hang out with your friends that night or go to the party. Um, a negative test is really only telling you that for the past 48 hours, you weren't transmitting COVID. But for the future, it doesn't really have any, any bearing. So we ask you that to still continue um, to be safe, even with negative test results. Um, we have HC Clear, which hopefully you all were able to use um, during move-in. And so we'd ask you to report your symptoms daily. And that also has your test results um, in there and will um, allow you access into the buildings and um, the library, dining, and all of those places. Um, if you have any issues with HC Clear, there's an email that you can email. It's HC Clear at Holy Cross. Um, and they can answer your questions there. Um, health services looks at those symptom reports every day and we'll call you if you're reporting symptoms and sort of walk you through the next step. Um, we have occupancy limits, um, we have guest policies restricting visitors in the residence halls, and then we have our HC alert levels, which as you all know, we moved in under an orange status, which means things are sort of closed down and locked down um, just for a, a week or so, so we can get everyone on campus and sort of build up our safety bubble here on campus. Um, and then, you know, COVID symptoms, we really want to know if you were exposed or if you had any symptoms so we can get you testing and so we can get you um, potentially isolated while we wait for your test results. Um, so the next slide is isolation and quarantine. So isolation is if you're an infected person, meaning you're having symptoms or you have a positive test. 
and quarantine is for close contacts of someone who was infected. Um, close contact is defined as living with the infected person, having face-to-face -face contact within six feet for cumulative 15 minutes in a day, or direct physical contact with a person who's infected. Um, we have isolation and quarantine space on campus, um, uh, and we have the hotel in Worcester, the Holiday Inn, where we also are isolating and um, quarantining our students. And you hopefully have all seen the latest weekly update from the coronavirus email account. Um, in that email, there was a form that went through all the isolation quarantine policies. If you live within 250 miles of campus, you're expected to be able to quarantine at home. Um, so if you're a close contact, you would be expected to be home. Um, we will be sending out follow-up information on that form. Um, if you feel that you need an exception to this rule, um, we'll follow up with that. Anyone who's positive will be allowed to stay in the college isolation space. Um, and while you're in that space, um, we take really good care of you. Health services calls you every day. Um, our IQ services, um, who are the staff at the hotel, call you every day. We let you get outside every day so you can get some fresh air and dining delivers um, really great food. You get to choose it off a menu. So um, they do a really great job with that. And if you're interested in seeing that process a little bit more, the Holy Cross COVID response website has a great video that shows the space. Um, I think that was my last slide. Um, and so I love to switch to questions. Let me pull them up here. Oh, good. There's lots of questions. Okay. <clears throat> All right. This is a good one. So policies for leaving campus to go home on the weekends if needed. So we're not restricting um, travel from campus. We obviously encourage you to limit your travel um, while COVID is, um, is going on, and especially with how high rates are in most parts of the country currently. If you do choose to go home, if it's within the state, um, that's fine. You can come back. And as long as you've kept up with your twice a week testing, um, there's, there's no issue with that and you don't need to report that to anyone. If you're leaving the state, that is something you would need to report to health services. And that's just so we can make sure that we're following the Massachusetts travel guidance. Um, the guidance is that if you stay 24 hours in another state that you have to, um, you know, have the test and quarantine until that test result comes back. Um, so we would just help you arrange that um, if you're leaving the state. Um, if you're leaving um, campus and you will be missing any testing, there is going to be a, poly a protocol for that um, and we will be following up with that information, but you would just let health services know and um, you, you'd likely have to quarantine when you returned until we could get you back in the testing protocol. So for example, if you had to leave and, and you missed one of your twice a week testing, um, we would quarantine you until we could get you back and test it on campus. Um, how will we know when to schedule tests every week? Um, that is a great question. So in HC Clear, that is how you'll schedule your test. Um, you hopefully have all kind of clicked around in there, but um, you can schedule a test there. The testing site is open Monday through Friday. Everyone is going to have a different process. Um, some people might like to test Monday, Friday. Some people might test um, Tuesday, Thursday. I just ask that you try not to go more than four days between tests. So for example, you wouldn't want to test on Monday and then Wednesday and then not test again next week until Wednesday because that would be seven days between your two tests. So as much as you can um, sort of balance your tests throughout the week, that's the best way to go. Um, we don't hold anyone to a specific schedule because we, you know, your schedules are going to be busy. So just trying to get one towards the beginning of the week and one towards the end of the week should be your goal. And we do ask that you make appointments if you need to change your appointment or you need to come at another time last minute, that's fine. You can go to the testing site without that appointment, but it is really helpful if you make regular appointments. It helps us um, balance the load of our testing um, site. Um, all right. 
in HC Clear, is it possible to update symptoms after submitting for the first time? So if you submitted symptoms um, and you made a mistake and you clicked that you had a symptom but you didn't, you just wanna call health services and we can help reset your symptom checker. If you did your symptom checker in the morning and said you didn't have symptoms and then you later develop symptoms, again, you would just wanna call health services and let us know that. Um, and as a commuter uh, student, if you're not coming to campus every day, just fill out the questionnaire on the days that you're coming to campus, um, first thing in the morning before. Okay, so some questions on um, the isolation and quarantine policy. So isolating on campus versus at home. So anyone who tests positive, and anyone who has symptoms would be allowed to stay on campus isolation space. If you're identified as a close contact and you live within 250 miles of campus, you would be expected to go home. And the reason we're doing that is if you can imagine for every one positive, there are multiple close contacts. So that number adds up quite quickly. And for example, last semester, we had um, on average, our one positives would have six to seven close contacts. Um, so you can imagine we would quickly fill up our isolation and quarantine space. And part of going home, um, sending everyone home is if our quarantine space fills up. So we're doing everything we can to keep our space preserved for people who are positive or who have symptoms. Um, and trying to limit um, the numbers of close contacts in that space so we don't run out very quickly. Um, if you feel like you need an exception, again, keep an eye out for, um, for that. An exception would be sort of any different um, reason if you have someone who lives at home um, who has a medical issue or you don't have a safe way to get home. Um, we really are asking our students to do their best to come up with a plan with your family. Again, that form is in the coronavirus weekly update that came out this week um, that sort of talks you through some of the options. But you may have um, another family member that you could stay with or, or a family friend that you could stay with. We really ask you to try and come up with a good plan um, to get home safely. And we will send you home with at-home tests that you'll get to do um, from home so we can keep testing you and we'll keep calling you from health services to check in as well. Um, <clears throat> all right, let's switch gears a little bit. Um, if my roommate and I both received negative tests, are we able to gather in dorms with other students who also receive negative tests while wearing masks? So currently right now with the orange alert, we're asking that students do not gather in dorm rooms. Um, uh, we ask that in the dorm room, it's just you and your one roommate, um, and we ask that you don't um, have other guests in there with you. Um, and that, again, is just to sort of get everyone here, get everyone in the testing protocol, have a couple tests under our belt before we start sort of relaxing things. When we move to a yellow stage, um, the occupancy limits um, will be posted. And so you can gather in common spaces and respecting the occupancy limits of those spaces. Um, students are not allowed to visit other dorms. Um, so you would just, you would be spending time with people that are in your dorm room. And if you wanted to spend time with people outside of your dorm, you just want to find a different space to do that, another shared space in Hogan or something like that. Um, the test we took today count towards the twice weekly policy. Yes, you can count that towards the twice weekly policy. It's a little bit of an odd timing because it was, um, you know, on a Sunday. But if you wanted to test like Sunday, Thursday, um, and then next week do Monday, Thursday, that's, that's fine. This test will count. Um, and testing compliance is one of our metrics that we use to determine our alert levels. So if we have a lot of students who are not being compliant with testing, that would put us at a higher risk and a higher alert level. Um, <clears throat> all right, how will we be alerted if we're a close contact? So the process that we have is when a positive test comes in, someone from the school calls that positive person, gets them to a safe place first, and then finds out who um, 
they have been in contact with in their infectious period, which is 48 hours before their positive test or their first symptom. If you are close contact, you will then receive a call from one of the school contact tracers um, who will let you know you've been in close contact. We get permission from the positive person to tell you who you were in contact with. And we sort of talk you through um, if you really are a close contact. Sometimes we talk and we interview you and we find out that you're actually not. You only spent 10 minutes together and you both had masks and were greater than six feet apart, then you wouldn't be a close contact. If we decide that you are a close contact, we would then help you with the next steps, either moving you to the college isolation and quarantine space or um, helping you um, figure out how you're going to safely get home. Kelsey, do you want to take a minute yeah. to talk about the go bag since we're talking about quarantine and isolation? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you, Liz. So um, on the back of your dorm room and then also on the um, isolation and quarantine FAQ section of the Holy Cross webpage, there's a list of things that we suggest you sort of have ready. Um, we're calling it your go bag. So if you find out that you're positive or you were a close contact, we kind of try and get you somewhere safely as quickly as possible. Um, so we, and of course, when you're packing in rush and you're, you know, a little bit stressed and worried about what's happening next, you might forget a lot of things. So we would encourage you to have a bag in place with um, a few days worth of clean clothes, comfortable clothes, um, extra chargers, maybe some books or something that you can um, keep yourself occupied with and um, just have that ready to go. So if you do find out that you need to move into isolation quarantine space, you are ready to do so. Um, and again, there's a great list on the back of your dorm room um, door, just in case you're kind of panicked and you don't know what to do, you can look there and on the website. Um, the quarantine period is um, 10 days from your last day of contact with the positive person. And that's sort of dependent on a couple things. So it's 10 days as long as you never develop symptoms and that you continue to test negative. Obviously, if you develop symptoms or you test positive, then we flip you into isolation and that can change your time frame. But on average, it's about 10 days. Um, if we test positive, do we get tested again to make sure it's not a false positive? It's a great question. Um, we use the Broad Laboratory. Um, they have a very low false positive percentage rate, um, very, very low. And the only way that you can tell if you are a false positive is if you retest the sample that the swab that was the first swab. And unfortunately, the Broad has so many tests coming through that they do not go back and retest um, positives if we ask them to. Um, we don't test you again because when you're positive, it's possible to flip sort of between positive and a negative swab from your first day of your positive all the way up for 90 days. And so that's why we don't repeat testing because it just gets really confusing. Um, so if you test positive, the Department of Public Health, you know, kind of guides us on that. But even if you were to go out and get your own test the next day and it was negative, we would still isolate you based on that first positive. Um, we can't ignore a positive test with COVID. So um, we do not retest any positives. <clears throat> All right, that was a lot of information. I'm just gonna scroll through the, if there's anything else, feel free to drop it in. Um, we've gotten a couple questions on the vaccine, the COVID vaccine. Um, as of right now, we um, are requiring anyone who's vaccinated to follow the, um, the same policies and guidelines to continue testing because um, we're just not, we don't have enough data on the vaccine. And as of right now, there's still a small chance that you may um, spread COVID even if you don't have any symptoms um, and you're vaccinated. So for now, we're keeping everyone who's been vaccinated testing, masking, all of those things until we learn more. And um, we are, as a college, working on um, um, getting the vaccine for our, ourselves and our students. Um, that's something that we're hoping to do when we're able. Um, but in Massachusetts, um, the general public, it won't be available until probably the springtime, which is 
when everyone goes home. So um, we'll keep an eye on it and we'll continue to keep you updated on that. Um, all right, and then there's been some questions on the metrics. Um, I, again, encourage you guys all to go look at the website. It explains what red, orange, yellow, green is. Um, we look at all sorts of things for the red level. Um, so it's if our seven day positivity rate is really high, if our isolation and quarantine space is full, if we have a lot of um, COVID infractions, meaning a lot of parties or reports of um, issues with that. Um, what else? Uh, testing compliance, so if students are not compliant, um, we look at that percentage. And then we also look at the state. So if the state is very high, um, that also um, could put us, push us into the red zone. Oh, thanks. And Liz just dropped that in the chat. That's a really good website to click around. There's lots of information there. Um, <clears throat> Does our entrance COVID test count as one of our two COVID tests for the week? So unfortunately, unless you test it on campus, it will not count because it's not in HC Clear. Um, so you'll want to make sure that you have two COVID tests on campus um, for the week. That's a good question. <clears throat> All right. Um, okay, food during quarantine. Um, if you have to quarantine, um, and you're in the uh, campus space, we deliver food to you every day. So dining has um, a menu that you order from and you can order breakfast, lunch, and dinner and they um, deliver right to your room once a day, whatever you've ordered. Um, and there's a microwave and a fridge in all of those rooms. And um, you would never be quarantined in your dorm room. You would always be in you know, campus space um, to keep you separate from others. <clears throat> All right, are we not allowed to go into our peer rooms even if they live on the same floor? Um, I wanna pull up the metrics just to make sure I'm saying this right. I think in yellow, you are allowed to visit other, as long as it's within your same dorm. But let me just pull up the metrics and we'll make sure that I'm saying the right thing. Okay, so under yellow, we have the residential guest policy. Guests of on-campus residents must be residents of the same building. External guests are not permitted in the residence halls. Guests must practice physical distancing and comply with the universal um, mask policy. Under yellow, bedroom is two people at one time and suites and apartments have a maximum capacity of six people at one time. So you could visit someone in their room um, as long as you're respecting those occupancy limits. So if you were visiting a friend and their roommate was somewhere else, the two of you could be in the, the dorm room together. And then under orange, there's no guests in, in other rooms at this point. Um, is a quarantine space at a hotel or on campus? So our main quarantine space is at the Holiday Inn in Worcester. We do have some space on campus in Loyola, um, but that's really overflow space and we're trying really hard not to use that. Um, if the hotel were to fill up, we do have a little bit of a reserve in Loyola. Um, but the, the main space where you would be housed would be at the hotel and it's actually really comfortable. There's a nice big TV and Wi-Fi and food delivered to you every day. So as much of a, you know, a bummer it will be to be quarantined for 10 days, um, we do our best to make it an okay experience. Um, any other questions, guys? There's lots of great questions. I really appreciate it. I think we got to most of them. I'm not seeing any new ones pop in. All right. Well, thanks, guys. And if you have other questions, I'll put my email in the chat. Um, you're welcome to email me. And again, you know, save health services phone numbers in your phone and um, call us if you guys need anything. I'll uh, give it back to Sean. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Lizzie Kelsey, for your great presentations tonight.
Tomorrow we'll be starting our first 24 Connects meetings for students who moved in on Saturday. Please check your emails for more information from your group leaders about the time and location for which your groups will be meeting. Additionally, everyone will be having a hall meeting tomorrow, Monday, January 25th at 8 p.m. with your RA. Please check within with your RA or with their email for more information. Also, continue to check the checklist on MyHC for more information regarding anything else you might need. I hope everyone has had a great night tonight and I hope you all have a great first week on the Hill. Thank you all for joining us tonight.